everywhere Most of the time we're unaware But horses know we're leaking all the time When looking in the fridge When Calvin does the bidding bridge The sergeant owls for fun and for the prize Cause sergeant owls are with us all the time You're still using the old database system you wrote? Yeah, there's one principle in uh, IT. Never change your running system. You are the word someone could hack it? Nah. It's on a local server here in the apartment, so only you guys can access it. Uh, it's AES encrypted and all my grades assigned with an RSA key, but you're free to try it if you want. I mean, that sounds like a challenge. You know Claudius' uh, first attempt with the pin, we put an if and else, right? Mm -hmm. To fix the... Uh, to make it constant time. So I programmed that in C, right? You can see that here. So there's a loop for each of the pin, pins? Right, so I compare digits. and then I do the same thing. So that should be the same number of instructions. Yeah. There's a true here and the dummy here, right? Okay, so in one case you mark the input as yeah. and then in the dummy, okay. Yeah. And so on my machine, that's constant time. Okay. So what's weird is, last week on Claudius' machine, it wasn't constant time, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. But in the traces I recorded, you can see that it's basically indistinguishable. Okay, yeah. Right? So blue is the trace with a completely wrong key, mm -hmm. and red is the trace with a half-right key. So and we don't see the difference for the... can't distinguish them. So this isn't really constant time then, right? It's mm -hmm. like pseudo-constant time. Mm -hmm. Maybe we find new attacks with this pseudo constant time. Right. So Daniel, do you have any actual plan for this episode? Well, we need to now dive deeper and show what differences on a modern computer system can actually occur. Yeah, it also is a great opportunity to show the students how to approach these things systematically. How to go from uh, C level down and um, the source code and analyze all of the leakage sources. So, when we compile this function, what does it mean for our attack? Mm, I don't know. Maybe we can look at the assembler? This is oh, right. Okay, so we want to look where... The main, I think. Main? Yes. Down there. What's this? I don't see a loop or even the functions we have in the code anymore. Both calls are gone. Yes. And also the loop is somewhat... There's no loop. So Did you use optimizations on this? Yeah, shouldn't I? Mm, I don't know. Maybe can we take a look at the non-optimized version? Give me a sec. I'll try that real quick. Let's see how that looks. Well, check pin function now. Oh, so it's not inland anymore. And there are my calls. And the for loop. And, and the loop. And both the calls, the mark dummy is wrong and also the mark input is wrong. So that's why it leaks here. Okay. Oh, yeah. There's a timing difference. Hi. Hey. What were you talking about optimization flex there? Just found out that like Claudio's test system is in one case when you compile with optimization like constant time code, mm -hmm. and in the other case it has like explicit function calls there. Interesting. And are there more changes in the binary? Oh, uh, depends on the optimization. So mm -hmm. as we've seen, this was like a completely compressed function. We don't even see the for loop anymore. Very interesting. I think we should take a closer look at that. So, I just entered the points for system level programming. Do you know mine? No, but I can check tomorrow. Bye! Every piece of code and data has an address. It, you can access it via an address with a pointer. And it can be gigabytes of memory, as much you have in, in main memory, basically. And now my code's like folded. Segfault is actually a great example. Uh, Segfaults are great. So, Segfaults, how is that possible? You have an invalid address. How is that possible that you have an invalid address in your program or let's say in your process? So uh, what you actually have is the operating system maintains a translation table there 
that translates virtual addresses, your pointers, to physical addresses. And in this physical address space, there somewhere there's the main memory. And you can access that. And now you can make addresses valid or invalid by mapping them to main memory or not mapping them at all. And with that, you get a lot of flexibility for these addresses. No. Oh. That's a pretty powerful concept. If I want to load memory on demand from disk, mm -hmm. I can just mark it as invalid. And then later on the operating system can just resolve that. And it might even enable more powerful concepts like sharing memory. So imagine that you have like the same physical memory mapped into two virtual address spaces. So then you have like this memory in the two in different virtual regions but mapping to the same physical memory. Exactly, but why don't you put all the data from the disk into memory then? And your disk is multiple terabytes. Yeah, yeah, good point. Going to work. So all the pointers in my programs are basically virtual addresses, right? So some of them are now invalid and the other ones are valid and the valid ones, they point to physical memory, also over some translation, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And each of these addresses has the exact same access time? Not really. Um, the timing differences can be really, really small, so it can be difficult to exploit. Well, actually there's one case that is a bit easier. You mean caches here, right? Yeah. Caches are easy to exploit? Well, I would say rather easy, right? Um, it's definitely easier than some other of these micro-architectural attacks and timing differences. So look at this figure I found. This shows the cache hierarchy from a modern Intel processor. So we can see here the different cores and the different levels of cache. So for the first level, which is usually a few kilobytes in size um, and the second level which is usually through 100 kilobytes in size these are the private caches and after these private caches we see the last level cache which is usually a few megabytes in size and this is shared across all cores so that means that the private caches they are separate per core mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this last level cache um, they, I read that they are often inclusive um, and that means that all the data that is in L1 or L2 also must be in the last level cache. So that means that if something is kicked out of the L3, it's also kicked out of L1 and L2? Exactly. If the data is stored in the L1 cache, we only take four cycles. And example for the L3 cache, it scales up to 31 cycles. And if you take a look at the DRAM, it's more than 120 cycles. That's super slow in comparison. But it's our cycles. The processes have like 5 gigahertz, right? That's 5 billion cycles a second. Exactly. But still, the difference between those is substantial. Why does it give a range for the L3? Um, Andy, can you show me the figure again? Sure. Uh, here it says ring bus. So the last level cache is also split up into these slices per core. And if you want to access data there um, in one of these slices, then the request and the data has to travel through this ring bus. So how do caches actually know what is stored in the cache and what is not stored in a cache? So caches use uh, cache lines to organize the data. And the cache line size would typically be something like 64 bytes. And then you have uh, a 64 byte block of memory either in the cache or not in the cache. And uh, yeah, um, when you want to request data from the DRAM, then first you check, is it in the cache? Um, if not, then you load it from the DRAM super, super slow, and then you store it in the cache. If yes, you serve it from there and it's fast. In a very simple cache, um, you might just have a bunch of cache lines and uh, then you select some of the bits from the address, maybe the virtual or the physical address, um, and say these bits are the cache index, and then you select the right cache line. 
So wouldn't that be very inefficient if I only work on cash lines with the same middle bit? Yes. So that's a problem that our virtual memory concept did not have. There we could place data anywhere in the DRAM. Uh, couldn't we use a similar approach here? So for each cache index, we have two cache lines. Mm -hmm. and That's actually what we call a set associative cache. Okay, so these two cache lines in the set are then functionally equivalent. Mm -hmm. and the CPU can choose which one to use. Exactly. This is an important explanation, but we should get back to the topic of investigating that leakage of the pin, Andrew. Oh, just, just one more feature, one more, and then we'll go back to the attack, yes? All this microarchitectural stuff is completely transparent to the user. You shouldn't see that, but timing is visible, yes. And there's one exception, I think the flush instruction, right? Flush, as in flushing? Yes, so I think the flush instruction is used to remove or flush one cache line out of all the caches of a core, of a CPU. So Lucas saw in your earlier experiments, you saw like timing differences without flushing the cache. So maybe we can look, take a closer look on that. I think the systematic approach to figuring out um, what is behind that is to start with the corner cases, like looking at a cache hit and a cache miss. Like a histogram of hits and misses? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looks like this. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, so look at this. We can see that no cache misses below 300 cycles. Wow. And also, if you take a look at the cache hits, they are all around 100 cycles. But 100 cycles, shouldn't cache hits be much faster? Lukas, how, how did you measure that? So. Okay. So first I run RETSC and then the memory access and then RETSC again. So RETSC is supposed to be cycle accurate and then I added memory fences to prevent reordering. Wait, 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 wait. Fences? You did not even explain out of order execution yet. We'll do that later. For now, you only need to know that without fences the CPU can reorder the instructions. Ah, but the memory fences, couldn't they? Uh, be the problem? I mean, the, the memory access itself, if it's served from the level 1 cache, then maybe it's only 4 cycles all the time. But the memory fence will also take cycles, the RDTSC will take cycles, and another memory fence, this will take cycles. And how do you run this function then? You call this function, you, you store this in some variables there, you run this in a loop. So this will all add additional cycles here. But it's super stable. The overhead is pretty constant. Hmm, that means maybe little noise? That sounds great. So now I'm wondering, if I run this uh, measurement loop with a flush operation on one of the two functions in the pin program, mm -hmm. what would happen? Wait, so you mean you flush the cache line out of the cache of one of these functions and then you reload it? Yeah, exactly. But this only works as long as this is in shared memory, right? Because you can not just flush cache lines of any other program. But wait, we can open the binary file of the other program and then it gets shared, right? Oh, with mmap it's mapped like a shared library? That could work, yes. And then we would observe one of the two cases. Either the access time was low, so that means in between our flush and our reload, somebody else accessed this cache line. And in the other case, we would see a high access time. That would mean that no one else accessed this cache line. Exactly. And then you know exactly when the cache line in another program was accessed. So wait, so if this flushing and reloading works, we found a new attack, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be in Paris for an excursion for university. See you next week.
what does he study? No idea. Oh, look at this. Whenever I run the pin entry tool, mm -hmm. I get a hit. Mm -hmm. So that means that the pin entry tool is using the same cache line as you're monitoring. Exactly. So what happens if you use the correct function and monitor that one? So the one that detects if the key is right? Yes. Give me a second. All right. So let's try this. So I'll enter the wrong key and I shouldn't see result. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I'll try the correct key. One, two, three, four. And I get a hit. Yes. It works. The attack works? It works. That means so you're, you're flushing and reloading this address and this attack works. We will be famous. This sounds like something really cool and really, really new. Very powerful. Daniel, but I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there is a paper about flush and reload. Oh. About low noise L3 cache side channel attacks. Mm -hmm. Again. We are too late again, I think. I think we sh still should... Um, try to break this pin entry tool because it doesn't look secure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have seen the pin with all zeros mm -hmm. and we did not see any hits on the correct function, right? Mm -hmm. So Lucas, what happens if you use the pin with all ones? Mm -hmm. Right, let me try that. Okay. So all ones. We see okay. a hit. So okay. that means that one of the digits must be a one, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what happens if you try now the bin, um, let's two. say two, 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 two? Yes. We see another hit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that means we know that one digit is a one and another pin must be a two. So we could iterate over all combinations and then select, for instance, one digit where we try out each of these 10 combinations and repeat this process for each of the digits, mm -hmm. so that we mean we have 10 tries and four pins, so that means 40 tries. 40 tries for all the digits, yeah. All right, so we start with something like one zero zero. Zero oh. as well. So that's a hit. So we know one is a digit, right? Yeah, and it's on a on correct position. Yes. So I could now try something like zero one zero zero. So the, okay, so the second position yeah. is not a hit. Yeah. Okay. So it okay. must be a one on the first position. Let me try that. Mm -hmm. If you think about that, uh, 40 tries. On average, it should even be only 20 tries, right? Oh, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. But for now, I think we know that Claudia's first patch is, is broken. Exactly. It's absolutely important that code is constant time if you want to make it secure. The same sequence of instructions executed, the same sequence of memory accesses, always exactly the same. <sighs> All right. Do you think Claudia's grading system could be vulnerable to flush and reload? Claudia's student grading system? Yeah. It runs on our home server, actually, in our apartment. But if it uses the bin entry, would it be vulnerable to this type of attack? He said it's encrypted, but he wrote it a long time ago, before taking side channel security. Wait a second, I don't think they should really hack into the database. In general, yes, but if they have explicit consent from the person or company that um, yeah, they investigate the security of, I guess then it's fine. I got it. I got the password. Really? If I just type in. Wow. Type in. Yes, I can oh finally God. check my grades. We should tell Claudio about this. All his AES encryption is now for nothing just because he got this pin entry wrong. Whew. It should be fixed now. Thanks for letting me know. Of course. It's the only responsible thing to do.